Photographers often talk about leading the eye through an image, but what exactly does that mean? It varies, but usually it includes the use of composition, shapes, and lighting to encourage a viewer to rove the image in a fashion that tells a story. Photos tell their stories in many different ways, but in particular, they slowly reveal new details and subtleties only as you dwell on the image. After all, like any good story, you shouldn't have all the best parts be obvious at a cursory glance. In an image, this means having interest in more than one region of the photo. Stories are hard to tell with a still image, but you can start by focusing on composition, shapes, and light. These aspects of an image tell a story and communicate a mood by helping to maintain the viewer's interest, draw their attention to the important elements, and also help the viewer skip past the unimportant regions. I'm gonna pull five images from my portfolio, some that I think do and some that I think don't, communicate interest, and we'll break down why together. This first image is of Mount Bachelor. This is from the Cascade Lakes just outside Bend, Oregon. Now the three things we're looking for in an image are composition, shapes, and lighting. So let's start with composition. To do this, I'm just gonna split up this image into thirds and we'll see if things roughly follow along the thirds. This is a classic composition technique, rule of thirds, but it's not ground necessarily. You can always break these rules. So when I break this up into thirds, what we notice is that the horizon falls along the upper third, as does the mountain. So one of the main points of interest in this image, of course, is the snow-capped mountain, which falls roughly along the top third. Uh, it also falls along the left third, although it's a little bit closer towards the center. We also have this region down here, all this green moss down here, which is where we get a lot of the color. That's in the bottom right. So we now have our two points of interest. What connects them together? That's where we get to the next part of shapes. In this particular image, of course, it is the winding jetty. And this jetty has a really peculiar shape to it. It's an S-curve. S-curves are probably my favorite shape in an image because they have a natural grace to them. Now, you'll notice that when the S-curve starts, it pulls you from the bottom left corner. And this encourages the eye to start going in towards the image as opposed to working its way out. Once it gets up here, it eventually follows the curve and ends up pointing back towards the mountain where the peak is. If the viewer first lands on the bottom third of this image, their eye will be forced to follow along and they'll pass this beautiful patch of green moss in the foreground, go to the midground, which is a little bit bleak and boring, and eventually proceed to the beautiful backdrop of Mount Bachelor. So this image has a great composition, it's got great shapes, and then finally, lighting. If we were to analyze all the parts of this image that are the brightest, we would see that most of the brightness is concentrated up here to help extenuate the beautiful snow-peaked mountain, and then of course, the water. Because those are the two brightest elements in an image, they have a lot of impact, whereas the edges of the frame are all darkened. That helps draw the viewer's interest back into the photo and keeps them from roving outside the frame of view. The second image is from Smith Rock, also near Bend, Oregon. So when you're composing a shot in the field, always think about the environment. For example, verticals versus panos tell a completely different story. Vertical is really good at communicating the height of a scene, whereas landscapes are good at communicating the breadth of a scene. This particular composition puts the skyline and the foreground right on the horizontal third. If we were to draw out the rule of thirds grid on here, we would see that the major points of interest fall roughly along one of these diagonals, or at least within one of the major diagonals. This particular composition puts the winding river almost in the middle of the image, but what you'll notice is that the river is in the lower third of the middle third. This is a really popular cinematic technique for composition, where you place a frame on the third within another frame or another region of the photo. So this helps give it some interest. So compositionally, this works. The bottom third is approximately the foreground, the mid third is the midground, and the background makes up the top third. But also, we have some really amazing shapes in here. Notice this hump shape that the cliffs make in the background. That's the exact same upside down M hump shape that the winding river makes earlier, and that's repeated over here along the path. We have that same M shape repeated throughout the image, which gives the image the feeling of repetition. We also have this path in the bottom, which you can almost imagine visually walking through to start walking down this path. In the foreground, we have this branch, which points inward up to the next point of interest, being the winding river, which eventually brings you up to the cliffs. But what if the viewer's eye starts near the top? 
Well, if we look at the shape of these mountains, they have this really cool bowl shape that drives the viewer's eye downwards towards the center where a lot of the interests can be found. So no matter where the viewer's eye roams, even if it hits the sky, they're going to end up exploring the rest of the image. Now the rules of composition can be broken, and sometimes they can be broken in a very useful way. This particular image is from Gimmelwald. This is from a village above Lauterbrunn in Switzerland, and this is looking up at the Jungfrau. Now if we were to highlight the main points of interest, we would quickly pick out the snow and moonlit mountain range at the top and these cabins in the front. But what you'll notice is that if we were to draw thirds on here, that the composition is actually a little bit tight. You'll notice that the mountain range isn't on one of these thirds lines. It's actually quite close to the top of the frame. This is echoed by the cabins down here at the bottom. So they're quite close to the edge. Normally, this might not work. However, this actually accomplishes the feeling of height. Because these elements, our main points of interest, are so close to the edge of the frame, it gives the impression that the camera almost couldn't capture this, which in fact was the case. I was shooting with a 24 to 105 and couldn't shoot wide enough to get some more distance around the cabins or the snowy mountains near the top of the image. Because of that, this gives the feeling of constraint, almost like we can't possibly take everything in. So I think it works in this case. To connect the two, we have this little snow-fed mountain stream down here at the bottom and that connects the two elements together. It's one of the only bright things you see between them, connects the cabin with the snow. This is a shot from England's Jurassic Coast. This is probably one of my favorite images from last year's trip to Ireland and the UK. Let's start out with composition to see why this may or may not work well. I'm gonna split it up into thirds. The thirds are a little bit rough here, but in the bottom third, we have the foreground. We have these beautiful stairs down here, which have a little bit of a hook shape to them to help draw you down to the water. Once you get to the water, we have the midground, which is this water in this cove over here. And once you hit the water, we have another hook shape. It's almost exactly the same hook shape. In fact, if you stare long enough, you'll see this hook shape repeated over and over again, like over here in the beach. Even down here, the bowl shape of the water, you could almost imagine has a little bit of a hook shape to it. If you look at these clouds up here in the background, they also have this hook, this triangular shape to them. So this shape is literally repeated over and over again. So we've got an interesting composition here. The main elements don't quite follow along the thirds. For example, this part here in the background doesn't really hit the major thirds. But now let me show you an image where these rules didn't quite work out. This is an image from Slayhead, Ireland, just uh, below the Dingle Peninsula. Let's first see why this may not work by drawing our rule of thirds grid on here. Slayhead, which is this little peninsula up here, does indeed follow along the top third, which I think works quite well. The problem is there's not really any distinction between foreground and midground. So you might say that there really is only a midground and not really a strong foreground. Some of the most stunning images usually have all three elements. Moreover, there's really only one subject, this peninsula and the coast back here, and they're both at approximately the same distance. The road here does connect the foreground and midground together has a little bit of a curve to it, which I think is quite nice. However, it's a little bit too close to the edge of the frame. If we were to do some vertical thirds here, you would see that it's really close to the edge. Now again, Slayhead does fall right along a third line, so I think that the composition with, of that is pretty cool. But unfortunately, most of the image here is made up of water, and it's just a really busy texture. So what I should have done here is moved a little bit over to the left and turned to the right a little bit. What this would have done is it would have taken the road and made it point inward a little bit more to lead the eye to the beautiful coastline and the peninsula. Then I would have had to have gotten down a little bit to compensate to make this region of water a little bit smaller. When we look at lighting, we notice that the sky is quite bright, so it does steal a lot of attention. The coast does have quite a bit of light that draws your eye to it from any other portions of the image. Unfortunately, it's not really well lit compared to the sky. So the sky does tend to steal the show. There's many more images we could go through here. And in fact, we'll do that again, probably next week. I'll go through another set of five images I had picked out for today. Again, you may not be a great cartoonist like Gary Larson, but you can try to reserve details for your more dedicated audience by spacing them out between the foreground, the midground, and background. You don't want all the points of interest to be in the same plane or at the same distance from the camera. You want them to be spaced out so the viewer has to rove the image a little bit. Again, we do this through composition, 
like following the rule of thirds or intentionally breaking it or by using the frame within a frame technique. We do it through shapes. My favorite are the S curve and the hook shape. And then finally, lighting. Lighting is the most powerful way to do this. Typically, I darken the edges so that way the viewer's eye doesn't tend to rove past the border. I hope you found this critique useful. Make sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with new digital nomad tips and landscape photography tutorials.